In this Huberman Lab podcast, the topic of hair loss and regrowth is discussed. Dr. Huberman explains how every individual strand of hair has its own little stem cell niche which gives rise to the hair for different durations of time depending on the hair's location on the body. For instance, hairs on the head can undergo ongoing growth for 4 to 8 years, while eyebrows have a much shorter period of growth lasting for a few months. The podcast covers the factors that determine hair growth, what regulates the stem cells that produce hair, and how to slow, halt, or reverse hair loss. Hormone-related hair loss, mechanical and stress-related influences, and chemical and mechanical approaches to hair loss treatment are also discussed. Dr. Andrew Huberman discusses various methods and treatments to maintain and slow down hair loss. He mentions that increasing blood flow to the hair stem cell niche is crucial to maintain hair and to aid in hair regrowth. One of the common medications used by doctors to increase blood flow is minoxidil. Another medication that is gaining popularity in increasing blood flow is Lodos Tadalafil, which was initially used to treat prostate health. Tadalafil is being used in small doses to increase blood flow not just to the prostate but to other parts of the body, including the scalp, to slow down the rate of hair loss. Dr. Huberman also discusses PRP, platelet-rich plasma, which is controversial in some circles but well accepted in others. PRP is being used in multiple tissues for different purposes, such as joint health, trying to offset hair loss or even reverse hair loss. PRP injections into the scalp are being done with moderate success but they tend to be expensive and transiently successful, and there aren't sufficient clinical data to suggest PRP as a treatment right now especially given the cost. Dr. Huberman also talks about microneedling, a mechanical stimulation of the hair follicle and the stem cell niche, to aid in hair regrowth. Microneedling is done by rolling a roller with tiny needles ranging in length from half a millimeter to 2.5 millimeters over the scalp. Dr. Huberman emphasizes that it's crucial to differentiate between stem cell injections and PRP injections as PRP is not stem cells. Microneedling is a technique that involves using fine needles to puncture the skin for various purposes. It works by reactivating stem cells in the dormant telogen phase, putting them back in the antigen phase, and thereby stimulating hair growth. Microneedling is also an effective augment for hormone-based hair regrowth tools and pharmacology. Researchers have found that low levels of inflammation caused by microneedling stimulate biological functions that relate to stem cell proliferation and maintaining stem cell populations. Thus, microneedling can stimulate growth by inducing micro damage and inflammation at the cellular level. The micro part of microneedling is crucial because scars do not have hair growing out of them. Therefore, the procedure aims to stimulate growth by causing micro damage and micro inflammation rather than significant damage to the tissue. The length and thickness of the needles matter, with 1 mm to 2.5 mm being more effective than shorter needles for microneedling in hair growth. Microneedling also causes a degree of bleeding and inflammation, which is part of the process that improves hair growth. Microneedling is not a painful procedure, but it can cause bleeding of the scalp, which can be self-conscious for some individuals. Researchers have found that microneedling shows some positive benefits in both men and women, regardless of age, especially when used in combination with other hair regrowth treatments. He shares that the combination of microneedling and minoxidil treatment together is more effective than either treatment alone, and it has been shown to be effective in recovering dead zones on the scalp regions with no stem cell population where no hair is growing. However, the growth of hair in these areas can take up to 30 to 50 weeks. While minoxidil treatment is successful in stimulating hair growth, it is also likely that one will have to use it for the rest of their life to maintain the hair growth they achieve. In addition, he explains the relationship between mechanical stimulation of the follicle and blood flow, which are essential for hair growth. As a result, Botox treatment to the scalp is becoming a common form of hair loss treatment. Botox injections applied to the scalp help release tension from the scalp skin, allowing for more blood flow to reach the stem cell follicle area, thus preventing hair loss. However, Dr. Huberman warns that Botox treatment must be conducted by a skilled individual. Botox is a fairly invasive procedure, but it has been shown to be effective for reducing the kind of squinting of the scalp that can occur and lead to hair loss in those regions, particularly in individuals with cutis verticus gyrata. Dr. Huberman also explains that the growth factor IGF-1 and cyclic AMP are the accelerators on hair growth, extending the growth phase. On the other hand, the breaks on hair growth are PD and TGF-beta-2, which shorten the growth phase or extend the catagen phase or telogen phase. These chemical players help explain why half of all people by age 50 start to lose their hair. While there are not enough large-scale clinical studies on the efficacy of Botox for hair loss, it is considered at least one reasonably safe alternative to things like minoxidil. Dr. Huberman also discusses androgen-related alopecia, which is hair loss induced by testosterone and its derivatives. He explains that men typically have higher levels of testosterone than women, 
but testosterone levels decline with age. However, some older men can maintain testosterone levels similar to younger men. Women also have testosterone, which is actually higher than their levels of estrogen, although women still have lower testosterone levels than most men. Androgens such as dihydrotestosterone inhibit the action of IGF-1 and cyclic AMP, which are necessary for hair growth. As people age, more testosterone is converted into dihydrotestosterone by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, which binds to the androgen receptor at five times the affinity of testosterone and inhibits hair growth. This leads to pattern hair loss, which is androgen-dependent alopecia. Huberman also explains that different people experience hair loss in different regions of the scalp due to genetics and the pattern of androgen receptors inherited from their mother's side. Furthermore, the density of androgen receptors determines hair growth in different regions of the body, such as the face and back. Those with a high density of androgen receptors on their face can grow a thick beard as DHT levels increase with age. Meanwhile, a high density of androgen receptors on the back stimulates hair growth, leading to a hairy back. He notes chemical adjustments can be made in the hair growth pathway to stimulate hair growth or halt hair loss. He focuses specifically on caffeine, which he explains is a potent PD inhibitor that indirectly stimulates IGF-1 by suppressing PD, which can suppress IGF-1. By ingesting caffeine or applying it topically to the scalp, caffeine can suppress PD enough to increase IGF-1 and increase hair growth or maintain hair growth in that region. Dr. Huberman also notes that topical caffeine application can be as effective as minoxidil application without actually lowering things like blood pressure and potentially increasing prolactin and some of the other negative side effects of minoxidil. However, he also points out that while caffeine may be effective in offsetting hair loss, it is generally used as a preventative for reducing hair loss over time and is not expected to create new hair growth to any sufficient degree. Additionally, Caffeine should not be ingested orally for this purpose because very little of it would make it to the scalp and hair follicles in the concentrations needed for hair growth. Despite the promising effects of caffeine ointments, Dr. Huberman explains that research is still in the early stages of exploring the dosages of caffeine in these ointments and their long-term effects on hair growth. He mentions that caffeine may maintain stem cell populations longer and that increasing IGF-1 levels can increase hair growth. However, he warns that prescription drugs such as growth hormone and IGF-1 have side effects, including increasing the growth of small tumors and the risk for cancer. He also emphasizes the importance of insulin sensitivity, as insulin growth factor 1, IGF-1, is insulin-dependent for its action at the hair follicle and stem cell. Obesity and insulin resistance can lead to reduced IGF-1 activity and hair loss. Dr. Huberman highlights the importance of regular exercise and a healthy nutritional program in maintaining hair health and also mentions the supplements myonositol, berberine, and metformin, which are known to improve insulin sensitivity. He cautions that these supplements may have side effects and that proper dosage and consultation with the doctor is important. Lastly, he mentions that sufficient iron is important for proper hair growth. He emphasizes the need for proper measurement of iron levels, as too much or too little can be harmful, and suggests getting an iron test as part of a regular blood panel. He explains that DHT shortens the growth phase of hair, and can eventually lead to the elimination of the stem cell niche. To combat this, he recommends using salt palmetto, an extract from the salt palmetto berry, which weakly inhibits 5-alpha reductase, the enzyme responsible for converting testosterone to DHT. While its effects are not robust, it is low-cost, has few side effects, and is readily available over-the-counter. Dr. Huberman acknowledges that some herbal compounds can have potent biological effects, as discussed in previous episodes but emphasizes that these must be taken at appropriate dosages and in the correct way. While there are some decent studies available, it is often challenging to determine which compounds are truly effective as they are usually taken in combination with one another. Some examples of these compounds include green tea extract, racy mushroom, pumpkin oil, zinc, and curcumin. Curcumin, known to be a potent inhibitor of the DHT pathway, has been linked to some side effects and is not recommended for everyone, although some individuals use it for its anti-inflammatory properties. Saw palmetto is mentioned as one of the few herbal compounds that has been supported by clinical studies for inhibiting 5-alpha reductase and holding a low incidence of side effects. Another commercial compound, ketoconazole or nizerol, initially developed for treating dandruff and psoriasis, is also discussed. An antifungal that can disrupt some fungal growth on the scalp, ketoconazole has been shown to increase hair number and diameter and maintain hair that would have otherwise been lost by reducing DHT mildly. Using ketoconazole shampoo two to four times per week with scalp contact time of three to five minutes has been shown to give about an 80% response rate in maintaining hair. However, it is less clear whether or not ketoconazole shampoo can stimulate new hair growth. 
Dr. Andrew Huberman explains the use of ketoconazole and finasteride for hair loss. He explains that ketoconazole cannot stimulate IGF-1 or activate growth itself, but it can offset some reductions in the antigen phase and exacerbation of the telogen phase. It is important to obtain a 2% or higher concentration of ketoconazole shampoo because many available shampoos are 1% or lower. He also mentions that biotin in shampoos might enhance the total amount of biotin that gets incorporated into the hair. Finasteride is a potent 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and reduces DHT, which can increase hair count by as much as 20% and helps reduce hair loss in 90% of all people that take it. The issue with finasteride is dosing properly since there is a wide variation in the amount of the different ISO enzymes that people make, and there are significant side effects that people may experience at a given dose. Finasteride comes in two major forms, oral and topical. Topical finasteride is taken in 1% solution or ointment, and it is thought that the 1% solution is equivalent to 1 mg of systemic finasteride. Finasteride was developed for the treatment of prostate enlargement and various issues. The host then transitions to the topic of hair and its biology and psychology, noting that marginal hair loss can cause severe anxiety for many people. The host shares a personal anecdote about his father warning him that stressing could make his hair fall out, which is not entirely true but is grounded in research that suggests psychological well-being can impact hair growth and coloration. Many people experience intense anxiety or depression as their hair starts to thin or fall out. He also discusses the efficacy and safety of using finasteride for hair growth. Finasteride is a drug that inhibits the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone DHT. Elevated levels of DHT in the prostate are associated with aging, and topical finasterides were designed to inhibit DHT in the hair follicle, allowing for more hair growth without causing systemic side effects that result from oral dosing. However, it is harder to dose topical finasterides compared to oral finasterides, and the effective dosages for hair growth cover a wide range of 0.01 to 5 mg per day. Dr. Huberman stressed the importance of taking the lowest effective dose of finasteride to offset hair loss while avoiding the side effects that come with a high DHT reduction. Dr. Huberman also discussed the logarithmic distribution of reduction in DHT at different doses of finasteride. A dosage of 0.01 mg per day can lead to a 50% reduction in DHT, while increasing dosages of up to 5 mg per day have a gradual effect that does not increase linearly. Dr. Huberman recommends starting with a low dose of finasteride to reduce side effects of sexual dysfunction, low motivation, and depression. People who take finasteride may increase the dosage if they don't see changes in hair growth, but this often leads to exacerbation of side effects. Dr. Huberman also pointed out that the topical form of finasteride can make it into systemic circulation, and the recommended dose of 1 ml of 0.25 finasteride applied to the scalp can lead to the same concentration in the blood as taking 2.5 mg orally. Therefore, people who use the topical form of finasteride should exercise caution and recognize the potential for systemic side effects. Dr. Huberman's recommended starting dosage for most people is 0.5 to 1 mg of finasteride as a tablet per day, although sensitivity to finasteride can vary from person to person. He warns against increasing the dosage of finasteride too quickly and recommends starting with a low dose and gradually increasing it over a period of time. Dr. Huberman also talks about the potential side effects of finasteride, including post-finasteride syndrome, which can cause severe symptoms such as reduced libido and mood disturbances. He notes that post-finasteride syndrome is a new phenomenon and that doctors are still trying to understand its causes. Dr. Huberman suggests that those who decide to try finasteride should work with a doctor, monitor their hormone levels, and start with a low dose to minimize side effects. Additionally, he claims that topical forms of finasteride may be associated with fewer and less severe side effects than oral finasteride. Dr. Huberman also discusses the importance of dihydrotestosterone DHT, in male development, particularly in embryonic and puberty stages. He indicates that younger males who take finasteride in high dosages to improve hair growth or offset hair loss are more likely to experience post-finasteride syndrome, which indicates that DHT is likely having further effects on male maturation, particularly the maturation of hypothalamus and areas of the brain that continue well into one's 20s and 30s. Dr. Huberman stresses that development is something that starts at conception and extends all the way until we die, and that different hormones, such as DHT, have different impacts across the lifespan. The post-finasteride syndrome is associated with sexual side effects, and while Dr. Huberman understands that loss of hair can be troubling and anxiety-provoking, he wants to emphasize the serious side effects that finasteride can carry even if one comes off it. He also explains to the steroid a molecule that works two to five times faster than finasteride at inducing hair regrowth and reduces DHT by 95%.
However, dutasteride is associated with a lot of side effects related to the DHT pathway such as reduction in sex drive and overall drive. Some people take dutasteride because they are very impatient to wait for hair growth, even though it is associated with gynecomastia and other hormone pathways. Dr. Huberman suggests that mild reductions in DHT can be done through mild reduction in androgen receptor pathways in the follicle and direct application to the scalp with things like caffeine, ketoconazole, or salt palmetto, whereas a potent stimulus for increasing hair growth is likely to be finasteride with low enough dosages and patients to wait for hair growth. He mentions that no one specific treatment is a magic cure for hair loss and that combination treatments that involve both mechanical and chemical stimuli are always better than either one alone. Microneedling is the most effective mechanical stimulus for hair regrowth. The combination of microneedling and finasteride can lead to significant regrowth of hair, even for those who were previously bald. However, there is no evidence to indicate that different treatments should not be used together, as they might interfere with one another. Dr. Huberman suggests that people start with minimal and effective dosages of these treatments, and to coordinate with a medical professional. He also mentions the importance of exploring both mechanical and chemical approaches to stimulate hair growth and to inhibit inhibitors of hair growth. He talks about the significance of hair to people, stating that hair loss is a common occurrence, and by age 50, about 50% of people start to notice hair thinning or hair loss. He also talks about how psychological states can impact patterns of hair growth or loss and how hair growth and loss can influence psychological states. Dr. Huberman emphasizes the two types of approaches to slowing or reversing hair loss, mechanical and chemical. Mechanical approaches include scalp massaging, which can cause hair loss or facilitate hair growth, while chemical approaches involve hormones that regulate hair growth, including estrogen, thyroid hormone, insulin-like growth factor, and androgens. Dr. Huberman explains endogenous stem cells and how they give rise to hair and hair growth. He explains that every single hair on our body is there because we have a stem cell population giving rise to that particular hair. He breaks down the structure of a hair into three components, the hair root, the shaft, and the little pocket at the base of the root called the hair bulb. Dr. Huberman explains that within the hair bulb, there are stem cells and populations of cells that have the ability to divide and give rise to other cells. These daughter cells then become the various types of cells that make up the hair. He also highlights the importance of melanin, which is the protein injected into the hair that gives it its darker color. Additionally, he talks about the function of the sebaceous gland and sebum in hair growth and waterproofing of the skin. He explains that the property of sebum, despite its unattractive name, is that it serves as a strong antibacterial and antimicrobial agent, protecting our skin from infections. Additionally, sebum serves the function of waterproofing and supports our immune system function. The erector pili muscle is another essential component of the hair that lies diagonally. The muscle contracts when we get cold or scared, causing the hair to become erect, and trapping air between the hair to warm our bodies. This muscle's contraction also causes bumps to occur on the surface of our skin, where little micro hairs reside and the dimples between them are where the muscle pulls down. The muscle's main function is to stand the hair up, providing a blanket-like effect, which is more robust in people with thicker hair. Dr. Huberman explains that the bulb-like region down at the bottom of the hair contains stem cells and pigmented cells that pigment the hair, capillaries that deliver blood flow, and oxygen to support the growth of new hair. Hence, several stories around hair regrowth involve statements like, don't wear a hat, or massage your scalp, to increase blood flow and oxygen to the scalp. Although none of these approaches are known to regrow hair robustly, they can slow hair loss or extend the duration of hair growth. He explains that different hairs on the body have varying durations of growth, with the hair on the head having the longest growth phase, which can last between two and eight years, while eyebrows have a growth phase that lasts for only a few months. The rate of hair growth within a specific body region remains quite constant, and the duration of the antigen phase differs between people, rather than the speed of hair growth. To achieve robust hair growth, other treatments must be combined with manipulations since many clinical studies have shown that they increase both the rate and duration of hair growth. He explains that the first phase of hair growth is called the antigen phase, which is the stage where the stem cells give rise to the cells that make up the proteins of the hair. Hair grows from deep within the root, and then eventually extends out across the top of the skin. The antigen phase lasts for varying lengths depending on the region of the body. The growth phase contrast for eyebrow hair is shorter than that of hair on the scalp. This means that the rate of hair growth is not the only important factor, and the duration of the growth phase also plays a critical role in determining hair length. Dr. Huberman also mentions the different structures associated with each hair, such as the melanocytes responsible for the hair's pigment, and the sebaceous gland that produces sebum, responsible for giving hair important antimicrobial properties. Another critical structure associated with the hair is the erector pili muscle, 
which creates goosebumps and is essential for keeping animals warm in cold environments. Dr. Andrew Huberman explains the three critical stages of the life cycle of a hare which are the antigen phase, growth, catagen phase, breakdown, intelligent phase, rest. During the antigen phase, the hair grows and during the catagen phase, the hair recedes from the bulb region up towards the surface. It is during the telogen phase that the bulb region, the stem cell population and melanocytes of the hair start to pinch off, recede and die, signaling the end of the hair life cycle. However, some hairs, such as the hair on the scalp, can re-enter their life cycle and grow again if there are oxygen, sufficient blood support, and the appropriate hormonal signals. Dr. Huberman emphasizes that the hormones are the accelerator and the brake on each of these phases. For example, dihydrotestosterone, a derivative of testosterone, causes changes in the bulb region where the stem cells reside, shortening or halting the antigen phase of hair growth and extending and promoting the catagen and telogen phase, resulting in hair loss. Inhibiting dihydrotestosterone can support the preservation of hair and encourage hair regrowth. One of the oldest treatments for hair loss, minoxidil, was originally created as a drug to treat hypertension. It is effective at slowing hair loss by extending the antigen phase of hair growth through vasodilation, which allows more blood to flow to the scalp. However, dosing of minoxidil can be complicated, and it may cause uncomfortable side effects such as headaches and dizziness. Minodoxyl can also increase levels of prolactin, a hormone that is antagonistic to dopamine and can cause reductions in libido and feelings of well-being. It does increase blood flow to the hair follicle, specifically to the stem cell niche below the hair. Minoxidil comes in two major routes systemic as a pill and topical as a cream. The dosage ranges of oral minoxidil varies from 0.25 mg to 5 mg per day, whereas the typical concentration of topical minoxidil is 5% and is recommended for once or twice daily use. However, it is important to leave the solution on the scalp for 3 to 5 minutes for complete absorption. The correct dosage for minoxidil is usually determined by hit and trial method, and it is recommended to begin with the lowest dosage and increase it as needed. Additionally, massaging the scalp or using red light on the scalp is also suggested to increase blood flow to the scalp, but their benefits are temporary. Increasing blood flow to the scalp is effective in slowing hair loss or maintaining the hair you have, but it may not completely halt hair loss or reverse it. Check out the full podcast by clicking the link in the description below. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. Thank you for listening to this podcast summary episode of the Pod Slice.